I'm making Buck Bowser. My love for you is ticking clock Bowser. Would you like to suck my cock Bowser? Did he say making fuck? The Northman is the most recent film by Robert Eggers, director of The Witch and The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse rightfully received enormous praise when it was released, and The Northman has, in my opinion, solidified Eggers as the most important American director of the past ten years. No other filmmaker has earned the distinction of auteur as magnificently as Eggers' difficult-to-define trio of historical drama horror films. Praise for The Northman was strong, but a bit more muted than for his previous work, with some dismissing it as a bit dull or shallow next to The Lighthouse. But I hope to explain why this Nordic revenge saga is just as psychologically penetrating as anything he's ever done. The Northman is the story of Amleth, or Amlet, which you may recognize as the origin of Shakespeare's most famous play. The young prince is heir to a small kingdom in pagan Denmark in the late 9th century. Amleth's story begins like all heroes' journeys when he transitions from a child into an adult. Willem Dafoe's eerie performance as a heathen priest hooks Amleth into the thread of fate. Should I fall by the enemy's sword, you must avenge me or forever live in shame! I will, Father! Live always without fear, for your fate is set and you cannot escape. Drug-fueled shamanic ritual gives our hero and the audience a prophecy, explaining the rest of the story. To be in battle slain, and in death rewarded by the Valkyrie's embrace. The instant he enters adulthood, Amleth's father is brutally murdered in front of his eyes. It's the first of many similarities to the 1982 film Conan the Barbarian. Amleth is terrified when his father is killed, rather than expressionless like Howard's famous Sumerian. The tragedy marks him for his entire life. Everything he does, or more precisely every act he performs, is related to accepting or rejecting this tragedy as formative to his sense of self. Amleth resists his uncle's assassins and vanishes into the raging ocean. His mother, his kingdom, his father, his destiny stolen from him and torn asunder. I will avenge you, father! I will save you, mother! I will kill you, Fiona! Tell me, how did Odin lose his eye? To learn the secret magic of women. Never seek the secrets of women. Our look at pagan Scandinavia begins with a hilltop fort of wood and thatch dusted with snow. Amleth is thrilled when his father steps off a longship, fresh from his brutal pillaging and slave-taking. The twin raven's thought and memory fly over the ships, indicating that this story is not necessarily the absolute truth, but a creation of the mind looking back on events. This is legendary dressed as history, or vice versa if you prefer. Before the film was even released, my favorite podcast host, Dan Carlin of Hardcore History, said that he would have very little interest in the movie because it wouldn't be a faithful portrayal of the Norse people. It's understandable. Filmmakers, Hollywood or independent, routinely ignore historical accuracy in favor of plot and characters, or just doing whatever ridiculous thing they feel like. Take a look at the 1956 film The Conqueror, where none other than John Wayne was cast as Genghis Khan. For while I have fingers to grasp a sword and eyes to see, your treacherous head is not safe on your shoulders, nor your daughter in her bed. While I do favor historical accuracy, I'm much more excited when a story embodies the spirit of the era rather than just the letter of the historical law. Probably the worst example of a history film, in inverted commas, is Ridley Scott's 2004 Kingdom of God, and yes, when I say the worst, I'm even including The Conqueror in that. The film is from start to finish almost perpetually wrong about the history of the Crusades. But more importantly, the essence of the Crusades is totally ignored. Orlando Bloom's character is a 21st century skeptic, who views religious conflict as pointless, and the Crusader cause as hopeless. The ideological core of the age of religious conflict 
is passionate, murderous belief, and Kingdom of God never touches on that. It utterly fails to attack the Schwerpunkt, the center of gravity. The Northmen, on the other hand, is an entirely mythological story that perfectly shows core beliefs and attitude of its era. There are plenty of historical tidbits thrown in here and there, like accurate peasant dress designs, or a helmet based on the Sutton Hoo mask. But the past is a foreign country. They didn't just do things differently, they thought differently. Turning back to hardcore history, one of the episodes about Caesar's invasion of Gaul brings up the fascinating point about history and magic. Because we were talking about something, he said, well, what about the impact of magic? And there was a long pause as my brain tried to figure out the proper answer to that, and I said, well, there's no such thing as magic. And he says, I know that, and you know that. But the people in this story didn't know that, and they believed otherwise. And because they believed these things to be real and true, it impacts reality, because they act upon those beliefs. Multiple events in the Northmen are portrayed first as myth, then as reality. What the Vikings did is a question of history. Why they did it can be found in magic. When discussing another Dark Age epic, Professor Archibald Strong states, Beowulf is the picture of a whole civilization. Beowulf is an important historical document. In yet another scene resembling John Milius's Conan, Amleth breaks into a sunken tomb to find an ancient sword. The tomb is guarded by a draugr, a word familiar to anyone who has played Skyrim as the Norse version of the undead. A brutal battle follows, ending in decapitation and period-accurate placing of the ghoul's head between its legs. <laughs> Then reality snaps back into place for a moment, and the sword is seized from a very much unliving corpse. Epic zombie battle or grave robbing? Where in the mind of ancient man is the difference between reality and fantasy? Etymologically speaking, the word draugr shares the same root word as to dream. A lesser director would complain about the lighting in ancient Norse homes, and probably make them unnecessarily and unrealistically bright so we could see the actors' faces better. Instead, Eggers embraces the fire pits and torches to cast an eerie orange glow in every room. The ground is alight. The people are shadowed against the light. At the very end of the film, the actors are entirely shadow men, only vaguely recognizable as ashen humans in the orange glow. Our first look at the adult Amleth, played by Alexander Skarsgård, is on a boat of hardened men ready to go a Viking into the east. The Vikings are pirates and butchers seeking murder and slavery. Before an assault on a Slav village, a ritual is enacted by the Berserkers, or the Bearskin Men, part of a religious cult in Nordic heathenry to endue warriors with the rage and speed of a beast. Amleth does not speak to his comrades on the way there, or during battle, or revel in tormenting the slaves. Like Conan, he broods. Amleth's first vocalization as an adult is the howl of a raging wolf tearing out his enemy's throat. He strides into battle oblivious to danger, or perhaps inviting it to destroy him. A criticism leveled against this scene is that it recalls a famous moment in one of the great war films, Come and See. That Soviet movie also had a powerful scene of a village of Slavic peasants raged to the ground by Germanic invaders. It's not nearly as soul-crushing and powerful as the Soviet film, but in Come and See we were viewing things from the perspective of the Belarusian victims, not the Germanic conquerors. It's a bold choice to be honest about the wickedness of Amleth and the choices he makes, 
as at the very least an anti-hero, if not a villain in a world without heroes. It would have been very difficult to suddenly switch views to the slaves rather than the enslavers. Crucially, Amleth is the best of the pillagers because he is the most animalistic, but Amleth can't enjoy the raiding and ravaging. Amleth is consumed with his melancholy thoughts. On the battlefield, his rage is utterly unthinking, instinctual. He feels nothing. When we found you as a cup, I knew then that you had the heart of cold iron. Amleth's journey is part of the journey of all people in the Dark Ages. How to go from animal to human. A major focus of literary criticism of Shakespeare's Hamlet is the ultimate modernity of the Danish prince's struggles. A neurotic figure always self-criticizing, believing in nothing but uncertainty, and consumed with the question of meaning. I've always felt a bit uneasy with this line of argument, not its validity, but applying it only to the people of the so-called modern age. Like with the incredible care and respect that Egger shows to the mundane objects, so faithfully crafted as props and costumes, he always treats the subjects of his story with great dignity. The men are different, not inscrutable savages acting in ways we can't understand. Amleth is on just as much of an existential journey as his successor from 800 years later. Since as far back as the 1300s when the term Dark Ages was coined, the artistic world has demeaned and patronized the post-classical age as miserable, brutal, and devoid of the finer sentiments of civilized literary output. Eggers refreshingly not only takes the era seriously, but sows all of the seeds of so-called modernity into the entire tapestry of human history. Uninterested in the spoils of conquest, the wayward prince wanders the ruins to find a seeress played by Bjork. She mysteriously knows his life story, his real name, and his secret of being without tears to shed. The prince that turned from his fate. A beast that cares for naught. A beast that brings tears from the eyes of man. The bizarre encounter wakes him up and he begins his dark quest of vengeance. Amleth is so obsessed with revenge, he discards his weapons, brands himself as a slave, and sails from the ocean of trees in Russia to the volcanic grasslands of distant Iceland. Your entire country is above the timber line. I am Amleth the Beowulf, son of King Arvand and Warraven, and I am his... This is, hands down, without question, the best Viking Age film ever made. Even just the huts and the village areas look incredibly authentic, and there are some absolutely incredible scenes like the deep draft Viking vessels as they're going across the sea, covered in rain, or another Viking ship sunk into an earthen mound as a makeshift tomb. Everything is expertly crafted to cast a spell of seduction over the audience. Of course, nitpicks could be made by experts in the Viking Age, but it's so minimal it's scarcely noticeable. In terms of the movie's length, some have called it into question, especially of the middle section of the story, after the Russia segment and before Amleth's revenge really takes off, but I don't think that's an entirely accurate criticism. His arrival in Iceland is a grim moment for him and the audience alike. He wears the somber brown rags of the other slaves, courts death every moment if he's discovered and quietly submits to grunt, grunt and, sweat and sweat under a weary life, life in the fields. I admit it's probably too long, and one scene in particular involving a rugby match could definitely have been cut, but the whole farm sequence is also broken up with exciting quests and characters. On the trip across the Atlantic, Amleth meets Olga, a beautiful Slavic woman played by Anya Taylor-Joy. She's been carted off to slavery, but begins a partnership with Amleth to destroy Fjolnir and free her people. I am Olga of the Birch Forest, and I too vow to escape this island. Your strength breaks men's bones. I have the cunning to break their minds. Olga might be criticized as less interesting than her counterpart in Hamlet, Ophelia. She is a character that has been subject to centuries of scholarly attention and analysis so maybe it's not entirely fair to compare the two. But I actually liked the fiery, rebellious Olga better than the dreamy, self-obsessed Ophelia. Olga may be based on a historical queen known as the Maiden King of Kievan Rus. 
Both real and cinematic Olgas dabble in pagan witchcraft to destroy their enemies. Olga is an active participant in Amleth's schemes. Together they wage a campaign of terror against Fjolnir and his mini-kingdom. Without her aid in crafting hallucinogenic potions to poison Fjolnir's men, or spiriting Amleth away from imprisonment, his mission would surely fail. Olga has no patience for Amleth's melancholy, and especially his fantasies. Olga is a Slavic materialist with clear ideas, concrete plans for the future, and simple responses to tyranny. Amleth's Teutonic dreaminess instantly sees obscure meanings in trivial events, even to the point of imagining supernatural answers to mundane questions. Like his theatrical twin, Amleth procrastinates coming up with multiple unnecessary delays to Fjolnir's death. First, he must contact a shaman and learn of a magic sword to bring down his uncle. Then he tries to free his mother with disastrous results. The Revenger makes moral pronouncements a bit too grand for his station in pre-medieval Iceland. You killed her. I will not kill a woman. Not even her. Njal's saga, for instance, features plenty of vengeance wrought by the simplest means of fully armored men descending on their enemies while they're helpless, unarmed, and farming. That was absolutely the norm. Fjolnir is a bit more protected than that, but he could be destroyed with much less effort by this rampaging, hulking viking. Amleth is struggling between the brutal violence programmed into him by his father and culture, and the simple realities that his father's murder may not be as repugnant as he thought. That old devil, Conscience, is tugging in his mind, stopping his sword arm. And as the saying goes, Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. This is the last tear you will shed in weakness. It will be given back when most you need it. Even in the 21st century, we're still consumed with Hamlet's ultimate question. To be? Or not to be? But Amleth is faced with his own question of being. The Dark Ages were a profoundly more grim era. Amleth's passage into adulthood marks him permanently with the idea of doom. The Doomsday Book of Anglo-Saxon England was merely the book of the law or fate. Modern English has adapted to our modernist hatred of control and sacralization of the will, turning doom into something terrible or evil. For Amleth, he can never escape his role ordained by the gods. It's not good or bad, just an unavoidable part of nature like the ocean tides. Fjolnir worships Frey and Freya, the gods of harvest and agriculture. He even personally engages in simple farm work with his son. It's slave work. You're the chieftain. It's your temple. And I'm the heir to this holy chieftain. No man knows if he will celebrate next Yuletide as a king or as a slave. Best to be prepared for both. Amleth, however, worships Odin, the battle lord and all-father, the Norse deity that gains ultimate wisdom through mutilating his face and leaving himself dead swinging from the branches of a tree. Fjolnir, though treacherous and wicked, is also much concerned with creation, whether agricultural or familial. He has ties to this world and means to keep them at any cost. Amleth lived as a beast and seemed to have no earthly ties and even no meaningful possessions when he abandoned everything to become a slave. His doom is to avenge and then die in the ultimate destructive act, though he's also confusingly the hero. Late in the film, Amleth is captured by Fjolnir and tortured, left hanging from the rafters of a barn. Someone visits his prison and frees him. Amleth dreams that Odin answered his prayer and sent a mighty Valkyrie to take him away. More prosaically, his partner Olga snuck into the barn, cut his bonds, and spirited him away into the night. This is not Valhul. I did not carry you that far. I am no Valkyrie. Amleth's life of self-abnegation and eradication is interrupted with an alternate road of life and romance. You found me. Were you lost? Only if you were searching for me. 
He begins to fall in love with a beautiful Slavic witch, and he sees for himself a wife, children, a kingdom of his own. It feels like this is the first time he has indulged in a real relationship and built anything constructive for himself or others. For a moment, he and Olga slip away from the road to hell and prepare to journey across the sea into a new life, abandoning all of that talk of revenge and hate. It was prophesied that I must choose between kindness for my kin and hate for my enemies. And see what hope we have before us. Amleth is moments away from severing his connection to vengeance and tying the skein of his fate to building a new kingdom. I was initially hoping, at this point in the movie, that Amleth would actually break free of his hopeless resignation to fate and subvert our expectations by affirming life and love for a Slavic queen. But Amleth suddenly regrets this. It's an act central to the theme of the film, the will to live, a primal, atavistic, and in the movie's symbolism, animalistic urge to procreate and survive. You will be mother to a king! We cannot escape our fate. No! In his own way, he decides to cheat fate and obey fate simultaneously, first by impregnating Olga, thus continuing his blood in the Tree of Fate. Also, he's willing to destroy himself to avenge things that happened in the past. Who is portrayed in the movie as the most utterly loathsome and villainous to our protagonist? Not his uncle, the murderer. He was just doing the horrible, violent things that all Vikings did. It's Amleth's mother, played by Nicole Kidman, that ends up being the real villain of the Northmen. Since childhood, Amleth nursed the dream that she was stolen by Fjolnir and whisked away to imprisonment. She coldly disabuses him of that cherished belief. Fiona ordered your death along with your own mother's blessing. What is her reason for being? She pretends for a moment that it could be her family, but this is untrue. She is only driven by the base, brutal struggle to live. Even if Fjolnir and her new son were killed, she would debase herself in any way imaginable even incest with Amleth, just to avoid death. You would be my new king, Amleth. And together, we will rule. Gudrun is totally empty of anything above the beast. Any religion or philosophy or emotion is all shackled to the relentless desire her will to simply continue existing. If Amleth ignored the dying wish of his father, denied justice to his murdered shaman, ignored the commandments of his fate, and went off somewhere to worry about his family, he would be no better than his scheming, grasping, and vile mother, at least in his eyes. Here we found the ultimate meeting of the movie, and of course in Hamlet, self-annihilation. The Northman's score includes vaguely Celtic bagpipe-like instruments, and thunderous drums in battle. But almost everything else is infused with a distinctly horror movie feel. Long stings punctuate crushing percussion, shouting choirs, and, and punishing brutal noise. It's a soundtrack of terror, belying the movie's aggressive action, and transmuting most scenes into grueling nightmare. Just like The Lighthouse was a drama that slowly became horror, The Northman is hard to categorize into a genre. But horror is as good a category as any, especially since it follows the most basic horror commandment of violent, inescapable victimhood by forces beyond your control. What if instead of a movie, you lived in an entire society based on the ineluctable destiny shaping your every action, where your own choices are irrelevant? Fjolnir learned this when he tried to take destiny into his own hand and usurp his brother's kingdom. His treachery and murder led to nothing except exile. He fled to the backwater frontier with his wife and son. After King Harald of Norway took his kingdom, Fjolnir killed his brother for nothing. He was fated to be the brother of the king, not the king, and he paid for it. In some ways, Amleth's actions are more vicious than Hamlet's. Hamlet's choices are constrained by his station in the world and his lack of alternatives after Ophelia's death. Amleth has every chance to try and build something with his lady love but deliberately rejects it. Ultimately, Amleth starts living in a waking nightmare, despite Olga's imprecations. 
It's a nightmare. Then you must wake up. Like all of the best revenge stories, Amleth has now crossed the line from a grieved victim to villain, graying the black and white lines of morality. His quest to right a wrong brings more serious injustice than the initial crime, ruining any moral high ground he claims. The final struggle for justice sees Amleth and his uncle reduced to raging berserkers almost nude against a volcanic eruption. These are the gates of hell prophesied at his destiny. Amleth does slay his uncle, finally balancing the scales and fulfilling his father's last wish. But this quest, like Hamlet's final massacre, is equally destructive and self-destructive. Both princes perish to bring blood vengeance and ruin a kingdom in the process. Amleth replaces the biological will to life with the will to power, to triumph over the materialist self and overcome the selfish desires of sex and love and ego. In his final moments, he sinks totally into fantasy, being carried up at last to his greatest dream, the gates of Valhalla. But remember that this is also a horror movie above everything. Eggers likes to play with reality and fantasy, and more than a few scenes in all of his movies sound like an unreliable narrator, badly explaining away violence as the act of malicious eldritch forces. It's reminiscent of the killer from Twin Peaks explaining away their actions. It was a demon that possessed me. I didn't kill anybody. Who was right? The last moment of Amleth's life may be his greatest tragedy. Trying to determine why he did what he did, instead of just being a father and husband, may be the same reason given in The Wild Bunch, when a bunch of violent killers go on a self-destructive final quest. Let's go. Why not? Amleth is consumed with superstition, fatalism, and death. That's where he wants to live. He wants to spend all of his life in Valhalla, warring and dying every single day and being brought back to do it all again for eternity. For him, the only way to seize his destiny is destruction. By not playing the game of life and family, he feels should be denied to him. Like Odin, he must destroy himself to gain everything he wants. But in reality, he just commits mass murder and dies. His death drive has taken over, leaving him as villainous as his uncle, and just as dead. Was he wrong or right? Were his enemies really as villainous and he as virtuous as he thought? It's all left mercifully unclear, open to multiple interpretations based on where you stand on right and wrong, and that's why it's always going to be a movie that we can sit and discuss and think about forever, because it's very unclear on some of these principles, and you can go a number of different ways with them. Or maybe all of that intellectualization is completely false and the entire movie is just an expertly crafted shitpost based on the last action hero. To be or not to be. Not to be. No, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, mixing together badass Conan with the literary sophistication of Shakespeare's greatest play, it could be the simplest answer. A big, tough action hero decides to push aside the nattering nabobs of Neurosis and beat the absolute hell out of his father's killers? I mean, I'm just saying. You killed my father. Big mistake. I will destroy him and all that you loved. I will become a hailstorm of iron and steel. I will have my vengeance. Despite all of the praise I'm heaping on the Northmen, there is an unfortunate amount of issues holding it back. I still think this is an amazing film, but I couldn't help but be repelled by a few severe problems. Eggers himself described the movie as Conan the Barbarian meets Andrei Tarkovsky. There's plenty of Conan, as I showed, but where's the Tarkovsky? There's a moment of superficial similarity between Andrei Rublev, when the heathens disappear into the forest for some debauchery, I especially like how this scene, and a few of the other desaturated shots, has a tinge of black and white to it. But there's none of the oniric qualities of the Russian master. None of the long, slow shots moving like a sleepwalker in a dream. Maybe it was studio interference, of which there was apparently quite a bit, 
Or maybe Eggers was just unwilling to let the scenes play on and on long enough to let them dream. Amleth's character does not really go through significant enough changes through the film, at least compared to his literary antecedents. As soon as he is inducted into Nordic adulthood, Amleth is on one long road of inescapable revenge. He does shed his status as a raging berserker to become a lowly slave, but it's a cosmetic change. A brief endurance of thraldom, one punctuated by adventures against zombies, sex with a witch woman, and stealthy murder. The worst criticism of Amleth is that he's the same at the end as he began, failing to adapt and grow from his condition. Which, as an aside, may be the point that he can't grow from his fatalist superstitions and ends up dead because of it, but I have to say that it's still a little bit boring. For an example of true change, look at the masterpiece El Topo by Alejandro Jodorowsky. The central figure of the black-clad expert gunman has a profound mystical experience that alters his mind and soul. His gun is cast aside, he adopts a monk's robe, and acts like a blithering idiot. A clownish fool allowing himself to be ridiculed daily so he can help a group of miserable freaks. Both Amleth and Jodorowsky's characters return at the utter end of their journey to explosive violence, but Amleth never tried to really be a fool or a wretch. It was all an ill-performed act, never fully embraced because of his heroic pride. The combat in the movie is not as engaging as it really could be. It seems too choreographed at times, without the frenzied chaos and danger of all violence. Though I do like this grabbing of the javelin in midair and throwing it back, I mean, that was kind of cool, even though, it, again, it felt sort of choreographed. That was another trope from the Viking sagas, like in Saxo Grammaticus, to showcase alleged manly prowess in combat, so I can see why it would be in there. But the other fights really don't have the visceral heft brilliantly done in Conan, where you really feel the weight of every blow struck. Like in this silly scene where Amleth is stabbed in the back by a child over and over again with incredible speed. <laughs> the most sinful flaw, though, is the dreadful and pointless use of CGI. I admit I do have a prejudice, a serious hatred of most computer effects, but there were just such egregious faults that it tore me out of this film completely. Laughable use of CGI on this fox, maybe? Or whatever this thing is yanked me right out of the film. <coughs> have we run out of little fur-bearing rodents on Earth? Do we need computer technicians to recreate them? What's the bloody point? This film cost at least $70 million. You're telling me you couldn't find a ferret wrangler to do this scene? Really? It just seems so lazy compared to what I expect from Eggers. The film's most important symbol, the Tree of Fate, is contemptible computer nonsense with characters cheaply glued onto it in post-processing. It's ugly as sin and, once again, could have easily been done without computers. Just find a huge tree or build a replica of one and hang dozens of actors from it. One of the most gripping images of 1981's Excalibur is a great tree, probably a prop, I assume. Its boughs bent low with the corpses of Grail Knights hanging from it. It's a hundred times better than this will ever be. However, all that being said, The Northman is still by a country mile the best Viking film ever, as I said. The competition admittedly has not always been the best. This is a genre that used Ernest Borgnine to portray a Viking chieftain. Ornan! It also tended to have an unusually misogynistic character that provides an ugly contrast to the fully-fledged, tough, and bright character of Olga the Witch. So there are a lot of things that this movie does better than is generally done in the genre, though it still does go with the trope that a brutalized young woman would fall for one of her destroyers, which is a completely normal and likely response to have, and not absolutely ridiculous. You do like me at all? What do you expect? You come in here, burn my village, kill my family, and try to rape me! Despite those flaws, I am still madly in love with the film. Every moment seemed designed to bring complete rapture to my Viking-loving heart. 
and I was just in decadent heaven 95% of the time. There's even a moment in the middle of that big farm sequence in the center of the film where amazingly they drift off into midsummer type Norse heathenry and human sacrifice and song and decapitating a horse. It's amazing. All the stuff I love seems to be slathered over every moment of the movie, and it was just ecstasy for me to finally get the Viking movie of my dreams. The Sandekite! My blood will live on! Valor awaits! So that's about all I can say about the Northmen. I think the real issue that some people had it, especially after the more meditative and quieter films of The Lighthouse and The Witch, is that this movie is the cinematic equivalent of a heavy metal album. The emotion that it primarily channels is aggression, and it's just again and again and again. Every single track on a heavy metal album, whether the song is slow or fast, is about rage and anger. So if you can get into a heavy metal album with its relentless aggression and anger, then you can probably like this movie, but if you're more likely to leave with a headache after listening to something like that, you probably don't want to watch The Northman, but you would be missing out on some absolutely great stuff. So anyway, uh, my name is Michael. Uh, please let me know in the comments what you thought of this movie. I really enjoy the uh, dialogue that it's created among Edgar's fans who were kind of expecting something more cerebral like the lighthouse and were really taken by surprise by this very extreme and upfront and violent film and didn't necessarily care for it so let me know what you thought of the movie oh what uh, Vikings didn't didn't use helmets like this obviously I mean everyone knows that now right I mean they don't I mean maybe they use horn helmets you know, for ceremonial purposes, but not in battle, you know, because you just rip it off really easily, you know, so. Still looks kind of neat, though. My love for you is like a truck bell zapper. Would you like some making fuck bell zapper? My love for you.